Hello, um, my name is Carson and today we're going to read Act chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. So if you have your Bible, please open it up. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests become obedient to the faith. This is the word of God. Well, thanks so much, Carson, and um, yeah, great to be with you. My name's Kirk. I'm one of the pastors here at Christ Central, and so uh, so good to be continuing to um, work through this uh, encouraging book of Acts uh, and, and to spend time in that. So we'll look at that passage in a moment. Do keep your Bible open there. Uh, but right now, let's, let's uh, ask God's help in prayer. Let's pray together. Uh, yes, Father, do help us. Uh, we, we just want to say that we need your help. Uh, we, we need your spirit to be at work in our hearts that uh, this word would resonate with us, that, that it would change us from within. So do that good work in us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I, can, I wonder if you can remember back to primary school and to... Uh, yeah, to, to what it is that you wanted to do when you grew up. Uh, did you want to be a fireman? Uh, did you want to be a hairdresser or a flight attendant? Did you want to be a sporting, you know, an athlete or, or something like this? Uh, what was it that you wanted to be? And here's the thing... Uh, if you can remember to what you wanted to be, is that what you are now? Uh, my wife Simone has a friend who she grow, grew up with, um, uh, and she was with her even in, in preschool, uh, and with her in preschool, her friend wanted to be a doctor. Uh, no one else in her family was a doctor, but she wanted to be a doctor. And when they would um, play together, they would play doctors and nurses. And she always insisted she must be the doctor. Simone should be the uh, nurse. And uh, so they went through primary school and she still wanted to be a, a doctor. And then actually they went through high school uh, together as well. And um, this friend studied really, really hard because she wanted to be a, a doctor. And she uh, took the appropriate subjects that were kind of leaning in that direction and then she went to university and she studied science, again, did kind of the anatomy subjects and so on because uh, that was the direction that she was headed for. She uh, started dating a medical student and got married to a medical student, did her GAMSATs, went to medical school and um, uh, finished medical school while having a family and lo and behold, after all of that, she became a doctor, as she had planned from preschool, which is pretty impressive, isn't it? Uh, how, how many of us uh, would that count for? Um, but that's what she did. Um, she was someone who was single-minded. She had this intention, she stuck to it, and she put all the steps in place to get there. 
Now this morning we're in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through to 7. And what we have here is an intentional church. See here what you'll see is that the apostles had this really clear sense of what the church is all about. Uh, In the passage that we have, the church faces some challenges and it faces some changes, uh, but the apostles are intent that the word and prayer would remain central to what they are about. And so they say in verse 4 that nevertheless we will give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And you see by verse 7 that the word of God indeed was spreading. And it's spreading because that was their main focus. And see, the church from a human perspective, it's it's formed through the ministry of the word and through prayer. That's what, what brings it into being. People hear of Jesus through the word. And as they pray and as others pray, they are transformed and become part of God's church. And of course, we continue to be transformed through the word and prayer. And so this is central to the church's mission. The church must be single-minded about the word of Jesus and prayer. But it's not always so easy because there will be threats to that mission. And so we're going to begin this morning with a problem that arises in the early church. We'll then consider a solution before going to the resolution of the early church as they work through all of this. It's a complicated outline today, highly creative, as you can tell, um, but but that's where we are going. Uh, But we begin with this problem for the early church. It's there as we begin in Acts chapter 6, and the problem we're going to see is unity, or a lack of it. Okay, the church is starting to get caught up in grumbling with one another. We're told there in verse uh, 1 that as the church grows more and more, that the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Okay, just to explain, um, the the Greek world at that time, uh, you, you had this you had Jews that had just spread out all over the Mediterranean. See, um, in, in Israel's history, um, ten tribes had been taken off to Assyria, and then um, after that, there'd been uh, the other two tribes, people from that had been taken off to, to Babylon, and then sort of um, post that, but Jews had kind of spread out all over the, the known world at that time time, just in little, little pockets of Jews everywhere, all with their own synagogues. And so many Jews had grown up in the Greek world, the Hellenistic world, with all of the Greek culture and language and, and, and so on, and they would still get along to their synagogue on the Sabbath morning. Uh, they were still Jewish, but they had so much Greek culture. Whereas other Jews were different, they'd grown up in Israel, and so they had a much stronger Jewish culture, and they knew their Hebrew and so on. And so in Jerusalem at this moment, it's this mixture of different types of uh, Jews, especially because a bunch had come in from outside at that feast of Pentecost and, 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 and had become Christians and had kind of stuck around for this amazing thing that was happening. And so there was this mixture of two different culture groups, even among the Jews. And as is so often the case, where you have different cultures, after a while they begin to rub. And, and the Hellenistic Jews here complain, saying, Hey, you know what? Our, our widows, um, they're being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. Now, if you know the history of Israel, you might know that Israel sometimes complained unnecessarily or wrongly. Uh, there was a lot of that in the wilderness. Uh, but the apostles here recognise that there is such a thing as legitimate complaint. They listen. 
They talk about it with the congregation and decide to set apart seven men to look after these practical needs. Um, most scholars think that these were the first deacons, which is explained more elsewhere in the Bible. And it's, it's interesting, when you look at these guys' names, that they're all Greek names. At verse 5, they chose Stephen, Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, they're all Greek names. In other words, the, the, the apostles and the church could see the, the reality of the, the problem that the Hellenists had mentioned, and they worked really hard to maintain unity. They wanted the Jews from this Greek background to know that they were loved and that they did care about their widows. So you can see here, as we enter into this section, that there was a problem facing the church. And as they sought to fulfil their mission to spread the world, the word. And the problem was unity, unity among God's people, and they worked hard to rectify that you know, last week, in the second half of chapter 5, there was a challenge to gospel mission there, and that was persecution. It was pressure from outside. But here, the problem is from within. It's unity. And the church here recognises that that matters. Now, we've talked before about Jesus' words by this, all will know that you are my disciples um, if you have loved one for another. And actually, the opposite is also true, that when love is lacking, it obscures the light of Jesus, does it not? Because Jesus wants us to be a new community that loves one another well. And, 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 you know, when we're not doing that well, if there's hurts or if, if people are only looking out for themselves or if there's an uncharitable attitude, people thinking the worst of others or if, if there's a lack of forgiveness, but when we have that happening, it hinders what the church is all about. It hinders the mission of the church. Okay, I've, I've heard people talk about this before from bad experiences that they've had, um, they've said things like that th there was a bunch of people that were just really, really intent on getting their way and while that was going on, no one was thinking about getting the word out. Or they've said things like there were squabbles at church and I didn't want to invite anyone. See, friends, our love for one another affects our mission. And so Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He says in Philippians that in humility you are to value others above yourselves, not looking out for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. What a wonderful example we have here in Acts chapter 6 of the church doing exactly that. They listened to one another. They valued others above themselves. They made every effort toward unity. And as a result, we'll see as we get down to verse 7 that the word of God continued to spread. Friends, unity matters. Uh, your relationships with others in the church matters. Uh, your relationships are either going to hinder or help the spread of the word. So, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit. So this was the problem, disunity, and then uh, let me spend a little more time on the solution now. Okay, certainly, as we've seen, um, an important part of the solution just was that heart that they had for one another, working hard to, to listen to, to one another and to love. But could I mention, too, that the church here was willing to get 
practical. Okay, verse 2, you see the apostles talking with the congregation and they say, uh, our role is the ministry of the word and prayer and we just shouldn't neglect that. Let's choose seven uh, godly men full of the spirit uh, to give this proper attention. And they get practical about caring for one another. And what a good thing that is. You know, um, James highlights the importance of practical care in James 2 verse 15. And he says this, he says, Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, Go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? See, he's commending actually caring for people practically. Okay, this morning, um, you will have filled out that care survey and as Luke said you know um, care first and foremost happens throughout growth groups but but we recognize that sometimes so sometimes care needs go beyond the capacity of the growth group and so it's helpful to know different ways that others may be able to help and what a good thing to just be able to get practical um, to help people with such down-to-earth things as cooking meals and doing grocery shopping and household maintenance and washing and ironing and giving lifts. Just this past week, something broke in my trailer and Dave Mack came over. He was there in a a moment to fix me with electrical stuff that I just knew nothing about. Um, What a good thing to be looking out for one another in practical ways. That's what was going on in Acts chapter 6. And you'll notice, by the way, that as part of that, what that involved was putting structures in place and being organised. Okay, they specifically um, choose at this point to divide up some roles. They choose seven guys to oversee um, that task. And in fact, in In 1 Timothy 5, we see later in Ephesus, uh, they actually had a specific list of widows who were going to receive care. And Paul's there talking about that and he's giving criteria for, hey, this is who should be on the list and this is who shouldn't be on that list. It was all very organised. And, okay, just to say that often as we get practical, just a certain level of organisation is actually um, needed. It, it is actually um, helpful. Um, and I, mean, I just mentioned that because I just want you to know that the Holy Spirit is not against having structures or being organised. Um, and I, I know that some here, the spreadsheeters among us, are just cheering at this moment, right? I'm, I'm looking for Joe Garan. I can't see him. At, but he would just be in the moment. Um, but what a good thing. There is an appropriateness about um, uh, good order, a certain level of order uh, within a church. Okay, God is a God of order, is he not? Think of creation. Think of Genesis chapter 1, if, 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 you, if you know it. What does God do? He, he separates light from darkness, and then he separates the, the, the heavens from the earth, and then the waters from the land and then there's the lights for the day and the lights for the night and then he creates living things in the sea and living things on the land and it's just this progressive step by step ordering of things and and when you when you look at creation i mean there is order isn't there think of I mean, wow, DNA, what a spreadsheet is paradise, right? Uh, It's incredible. Um, God is an ordered God. Uh, You know, sometimes in church we can can wish that everything would just happen organically and how lovely and how wonderful when it does. But here in Jerusalem, as the church grew, the apostles realised that some things were being overlooked and that it could be a helpful way of loving people well to set up structures to avoid people being overlooked and to make sure that certain things happened. 
That's what they did. And so could I just say that though the ministry of the word and prayer is at the centre of what the church should be about, yet still there's a certain amount of organisation that's necessary for a church to love others well and to get the gospel out. Of, I mean, I've just got to say I'm just so thankful for ones like um, Glenda. She gives a day, a day and a half, a week to just helping the staff ad- administratively. Um, Karen McKee gives several hours a, a week, our committee of management. All that is done around finance and government and petri property and, and, and other uh, things. Then there's our, our team leaders, a, a good amount of coordination going on uh, there. And I mean, actually just being part of a team, it's going to involve a certain amount of organisation. I know how much all of you love checking your group chats and responding and giving those emojis and, and, and so on and noticing when you're rostered on. Um, but, but the point is this, there's a certain level of organisation that just is necessary if we're to love one another well and if we're to tell others about Jesus. Okay, the illustration's often been used of a trellis and a vine. Um, Obviously, if you're growing a vine, the vine is the main thing. But a certain amount of trellis, a certain amount of structure is actually going to help the vine. The trellis is not the main thing, um, but there's a... And it shouldn't ever become the main thing, but there's a certain extent to which that's necessary and helpful. So the church here in Acts 6 gets very practical about solving this problem. Uh, They're going to make sure these widows are physically supported. They'll even spend time rethinking, organising, communicating, setting up so that they can love them well. They come up with a very practical solution. So there's a solution, and finally what I want to finish with is a resolution. And here I'm returning to where we began, uh, which is just with that reminder that in all the goings on in these verses, yet nevertheless the apostles did have a, that clear resolution that we've talked about, that the prayer, that, that prayer and the word about Jesus that it was going to... Uh, to have priority. Can notice what's repeated in these seven verses? When something is repeated in in a section of the Bible, by the way, it gives you a sense of what the main point is. And and so notice what comes up again and again. Look at verse um, 2. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Then also the end of verse 3, into verse 4, it says, we will turn this responsibility over to them and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. And then notice again, verse 6, they prayed and laid hands on them. And the result of all of this, verse 7, so the word of God spread. See, there's a direction to where all of this is heading. You you see that? You see the climax uh, there? It's all heading to the spreading of the word in people's hearts, in people's lives, and and, and the way that that happens is as the word and prayer in particular, uh, the word and prayer in particular, take priority. That's the main thing. Some of the other things are unimportant or that they're not dealt with, but there is a main thing. You know, um, David Cook um, it was a great pastor down in Sydney. Um, some of you may know of him. He talks about the time when he began ministering, and he says that there were some words by the church historian Martin Marty that really struck him. And it was this. He said, the main thing is that the main thing remains the main thing. Uh, and... And that's what the apostles are saying here in Acts chapter 6. They're saying, yes, we must care for these physical needs. And so let's set up a structure and let's make, make sure that that happens. But at the same time, the word and prayer, it, it must remain the main thing. Okay, I'm reminded of, of Jesus in, 
in Mark chapter 1, and his ministry has just begun in Galilee, and he's become known for his healing, and we're told that it's becoming quite a thing. In, in the evening, um, people brought all the sick, it says, and the whole town, it says, gathered at the door, and, and Jesus healed many. So, I mean, this is quite a moment, and then the next day, No one knows where Jesus is. The disciples are looking for him and eventually they find him. He's gone off to a solitary place to pray. And the disciples exclaim, Jesus, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus replies, let's go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. See, Jesus is saying there's something more important even than physical healing. It's that people would respond to the word. That even that that's even more fundamental. And maybe as you hear that, I mean, maybe you find that confronting. Um, surely it was more important that people be healed. Uh, but Jesus wants you to understand that you can be body perfect, you can have the frame of an athlete, Um, but if you are not cleansed of your sin, well, a, a model body will not make a difference for you in eternity when you meet your maker. See, there's something more important than even our physical health. It's the state of our soul before God. And it's the word of God. It's the word of Jesus and all that he's done in his life and in his death and in his resurrection. That's what's most transformative for your life now and into eternity. So this must be our priority, the word and prayer. And I would just say to you, if if you're here today and you don't yet know Jesus, firstly, what a great thing that you're here. How good is that? Um, That you would be hearing the word of Jesus and all that he's done. How how good. But also I'd say, whatever else is going on in your life right now, and and maybe you've got a, a bunch of things going on in your life right now, there's probably a fair bit, but just whatever else is going on in your life right now, make it your priority to get to know Jesus, to respond to him through prayer, through confessing your sins, to, through just, just putting your trust in him. Um, it just, that, that matters more than anything else, our relationship with God through Jesus. The word and prayer. And you know, for, for each one of us, we all need this priority, don't we? So let me just spend a little bit of time now pressing into this some more. Um, what might it look like for us to prioritise the word and prayer? I want to just finish this morning with four thoughts on this. Um, no doubt um, you'll be able to add to this, but um, here's, here's a few things to just get us started. Um, what might it look like for us to prioritise this? Firstly, look for informal opportunities for the ministry of the word and prayer. Okay, what I'm trying to say here is that as helpful as the formal opportunities are, and they are absolutely really helpful and important, but just as helpful as they are, let's not restrict the word and prayer to that. There's actually lots of opportunities to encourage one another um, over morning tea, um, after a growth group, after youth, whatever it might be. Um, Lots of opportunities for that. I mean, you might not necessarily quote a Bible verse, but A simple comment like, oh wow, that discussion in the growth group tonight about um, that that particular section, I found that really helpful or I found that really challenging. And I mean, that sort of thing can just really open up a helpful, healthy, word-based conversation. Um, Use the informal opportunities. And, you know, could I say that around prayer as well? I, I remember a moment, um, I, I, I went to a Christian conference, I got chatting to a guy after it. I'd never met the guy before, um, but somehow, 
Somehow in our conversation it came up that actually I'd, I'd been through some, some rough waters recently and, and, and he said, oh mate, that sounds tough. Can I just pray for you? And so there we were after supper, uh, uh, after the conference, having supper. He stops, he prays for me and I just so appreciated that. It, just, it, it meant a lot to me in that moment. So he, he took the informal moment and he prayed what a good thing to do. So look for informal opportunities uh, for the ministry of the word and prayer. Very rarely will people mind if you just say, hey, can I just pray for you in that? Most people will really appreciate it. Secondly, um, make the most of formal opportunities for the word and prayer. Okay, there's... <clears throat> There's church, there's growth group, there's youth, there's kids. Um, some of you do um, one-to-one studies, which is awesome. Um, mission prayer nights, um, prayer table, uh, various other um, training moments. Just say, make the most of those formal opportunities that you get and prioritise it, put it into your calendar at first. It's the bread and butter of church life, so make it so. Um, Make the most of those formal opportunities. Thirdly, a bit of an extension um, from that, but just to say too, just beware that serving Jesus doesn't end up replacing hearing his word and coming to him in prayer. Okay, I'm, I'm thinking into this idea here, which I think is kind of the, you know, the, the, the main point of Acts 6, 1 to 7, which is that, um, that there is the good, but make sure that the good doesn't replace the better, right? And, and I'm thinking here of the, the story of Jesus in Mary and Martha's home in Luke chapter 10. Um, And Martha's distracted by a whole bunch of preparations um, with with, with Jesus being there and and hosting and so on. Whereas Mary, we're told, she she sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. And Martha gets upset about this and um, she, she even goes to Jesus and she wants Jesus to kind of pip Mary for this. But... In the end, Jesus says, actually, Martha, um, Mary has chosen what is better, he says. She had chosen the better path because she recognised the priority of spending time with Jesus, even over serving him. Okay, I know, for example, that a bunch of you uh, serve in, uh, who serve in kids, you actually make sure that you're still getting to the other gathering as well, um, so that you're still hearing the word, so that you're still uh, praying. And what a good thing that is, to just recognise the priority of sitting at Jesus' feet and listening to him. We want to beware that serving doesn't replace sitting at Jesus' feet. Well, fourthly then, and finally, and this is a slightly different direction to the the first three applications, but just to say, um, expect that your elders, expect that your pastors and kids' ministry, worker and, and so on, just expect that they will primarily give their time to prayer, and the ministry of the word. And just value that. Um, Okay, here in Acts 6, the apostles were really working hard to protect that focus. Um, That the word and prayer should be their key responsibility. And I just want to say that there's actually, there's so many good things that a church can be involved in. And Pastors and elders often wrestle with that. Um, They wrestle with, yeah, there's this good thing that we could do, or this good thing that we could do, or this good thing that we could do, or this good thing. But we must make sure that we we also just leave enough time for the ministry of the word and prayer. So I'm just saying, just expect that your pastors and elders, expect that of them, um, that 
their job first and foremost is the ministry of the word and prayer. And just be aware that sometimes it means that um, they won't be able to devote as much time as they would want to other really good things. Well, this is a resolution that you have in this passage. The, the apostles were focused. The apostles were single-minded. They, they wanted the word of Jesus to be known. And as I said earlier, um, the, there was wonderful fruit that came from this single-mindedness. The fruit is there in verse 7. Check that out. What we're told there is, so the word of God... Spread, And the number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. Let's see, the word and prayer took pride of place. And as that happened, it multiplied. It multiplied and it dug down deep into people's hearts and lives. And the number of disciples increased rapidly. And isn't that what we want? To see people discover Jesus... To see people grow in Jesus and that this would multiply. And so with that in view, let's seek to be an intentional church, to be single-minded in the word and in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, yes, Heavenly Father, thank you for the good gospel that we have. Thank you for Jesus, for his life, for his death, for his, uh, for, for his resurrection and for the word that we have received from you uh, about this, that we would know Jesus, that we would experience the forgiveness of sins and that we would know eternal life through faith in him. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you for your care for, for, for us, not only for our bodies as we know that you would work all of that out um, in the end, but also for our souls. We thank you for that. Uh, We thank you for um, your people here, for um, hearts of love toward one another, for practical ways in which um, people um, care for each other, and we pray that you would continue to grow us in that, and especially that you would grow us in the word and in prayer. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, isn't it incredible that, that, that single-mindedness and the devotion of the early church and the apostles to prayer and the ministry of the word